We took a detour in our Chronicles series to look at the symbolism of the Bronze Sea and the menorah in detail. This time we'll tie up some of the loose ends of the temple building of chapters 3 and 4. There's still plenty of symbolism to cover. And like the previous videos, we're going to get repeated symbols of original creation embedded in this account. Now we're mostly going to jump around and talk more broadly about this section. I'd encourage you to read it on your own. But let's first map out the edges of this unit, which spans chapter 3 to verse 1 of chapter 5. The entirety of chapter 3 is 238 words, or 14 times 17. If you've followed along so far, you already know that 17 is the numeric value of the divine name Yahweh, as well as the number value of the term glory, Kavod. 14, of course, is the value of the name David, though in this case it's probably a coincidence. And then there's an unfortunate chapter break between chapters 4 and 5. Chapter 4 should extend into verse 1 of chapter 5. That's where the Masoretes put the break. Even our English translations tend to put a space after verse 1, ending the unit there. And verse 1 is actually 17 words long, and separating verse 1 from the rest of chapter 5 makes the entirety of that chapter, chapter 5, 221 words, or 13 times 17. Again, another multiple of a divine number. But the end of this unit, chapter 5, verse 1, has some interesting language. And it reads, Thus all the work that Solomon did for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated and stored, the silver, the gold, and all the vessels and the treasuries of the house of God. Of interest here is this language here of work, as well as this language over here of bid. It's all the work that Solomon did for the house of the Lord. In English, it might not seem significant, but it actually is, because this language mirrors Genesis 2, 2, and 3. Commenting on this make language, which is Asa, Lightheart writes in his commentary on page 107, in some there are 13 makings of Solomon six makings of Hurim, and three makings of Solomon. So in total, that's 22 makings, 22 being the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. The text presents an alphabet of construction from Aleph to Tav. In the video on the menorah, we noted the lampstand had 22 cups. And so we discussed a little bit about the symbolism then. But this Asa language also connects back to older makings. In Genesis 2.1, we're told the heavens and the earth were finished. Using the same term, including the tabernacle narrative, near the very end of Exodus. That specific language isn't used here in Chronicles, but the other term, usually translated work, is used in all three passages, as well as the aforementioned Asa term. And that binds all three passages together original creation by God, the tabernacle's construction by Moses, and the temple's construction by Solomon. But once again, another instance of this language that brings back to mind original creation, as well as the construction of the tabernacle. But picking back up with Lightheart in his commentary, he says, Second Chronicles 4.10 clarifies what orientation the chronicler is using. The sea is to the right, and that is explained as southeast, since the temple is oriented on an east-west axis, and the south is to the right. Right and left are being described from the perspective of someone within the temple looking out. That is, right and left are designated from the perspective of Yahweh enthroned in the inner western sanctuary, facing the eastern front door. And that's an interesting detail, because it matches the Garden of Eden. At the end of the account in Genesis 3, we're told of the cherub and the flaming sword set to guard the eastern entrance. By the way, that same language of guarding is used of what Adam was supposed to do in the garden. He failed, so now a divine creature is given the task. But this guarding the east implies that that's where the entrance was located. There could also be a pun involved, because east could be translated formerly or something referring to ancient times. But again, it's just another one of these things that connects the temple back with the Garden of Eden. And then Lightheart's going to move on to an interesting detail concerning the cherubim in the most holy place. Lightheart writes, Within the inner sanctuary are two new cherubim each 10 cubits high, with a 2 cubit wingspan. Their wings cleave and spread, in verse 12 and 13, and that's Lightheart's translation, forming a covering for the ark. Both terms have marital connotations. 
Adam was to cleave to his wife so as to become one flesh. In marriage, a man spreads the wing of his garment to cover his bride. You get this in Ruth, for instance. The ark is the throne of Yahweh. His inner sanctuary is the inner room where he has intimate communion with his bride. And Lightheart is very well read, so he may be aware of this. But this trajectory is something that is picked up on and greatly expanded in much later rabbinic mystical traditions. Now, some of that stuff veers into unhelpful and potentially sacrilegious territory, but still, they may be building on something that's present. The more grounded but still speculative interpretation is that these two cherubim were representations of Adam and Eve, the first couple, which would make sense given the most holy place corresponds to the Garden of Eden. But here's a brief section from Andre Orlov's Dark Mirrors book that gives a taste of some of the rabbinic discussion. In Orlov writes, this treatise in the Babylonian Talmud contains two passages that offer striking, if not scandalous, descriptions of the intertwisted cherubim in the Holy of Holies. Thus, Rabbi Katina said, whenever Israel came up to the festival, the curtain would be removed for them, and the cherubim were shown to them whose bodies were intertwisted with one another, and they would be thus addressed, Look, you are beloved before God, as the love between man and woman. Orlov writes, This obscure passage relates an erotic union of the cherubic angelic servants holding the presence of the deity. One might see here later rabbinic innovations, which are far distant, or maybe even completely divorced, from the early biblical tradition of the cherubim in the Holy of Holies. Still. Scholars have previously noted that early biblical accounts already hint at the ambiguous proximity of the famous cherubic pair. Rachel Elior notes that in some biblical materials, descriptions of them usually imply a posture characterized by reciprocity or contact. They faced each other, or also their wings touched each other, or even joined together. While the early traditions about the cherubim found both in the Bible and elsewhere imply varying degrees of proximity and contact, Later tradition was more explicit, clearly indicating the identity of the cherubim as a mythical symbolization of reproduction and fertility expressed in the form of intertwined male and female. This reminds me of something Heiser used to say. He would say, affirming the obvious and extrapolating to the unnecessary. Except here, it's affirming the speculative and extrapolating to the unnecessary. It seems obvious to me the reason the wings of various cherubim are touching is because in all of those passages, this touching language is mentioned, they're forming some kind of throne or seat for Yahweh to sit. So we don't have to go as far off the deep end as the later rabbis did. But even going with the more conservative version that Lightheart gives, I think you could combine that with that idea that the two cherubim are symbolic of Adam and Eve, or they're reminiscent of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Way back in the chapter three video, I mentioned that I wanted to pull out some articles and things like that so we could get a visual of some of the stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and throw that in now. Here we have a front view of the uh, temple. Here you, you see the bronze altar. And here they have it stepped like a pyramid or a ziggurat type staircase. Here you have the bronze sea over here, symbols of earth and sea over here. You have the freestanding pillars over here, Jacob and Boaz. And there's debate about whether they're freestanding like this or whether they actually supported something above. And we'll take a look at the other versions of this in a moment. I'm mostly just going to scrub through this. I'm not going to read much of anything. We'll just kind of look at some of the pictures. I'll upload this article to uh, Ko-Fi so you can download it if you want, because there's quite a bit of information here. Here you see the capitals, the uh, pillars here, capitals there. More depictions of various aspects. Here's the cutaway side view. Here you see the 10 lampstands, as well as there's the Ark of the Covenant there. Here are the cherubim, the two cherubim in the most holy place. Here the room is a cube shape. Moving on, depictions of cherubim within the walls. And we mentioned this in the lampstand video that there's debate about the menorah, about the shape of it. And he says, if the menorah form of the lampstand was used in the period of the Israelite monarchy, the example is yet to be known. In other words, they haven't found an excavation work 
a lampstand that is shaped like the traditionally shaped menorah from this era. Usually from this era, they're going to look more like this over here or this over here where you have the uh, seven lights, but it's kind of in this star shape. But this is why you'll sometimes get these different depictions. Here's the doorway leading into the Holy of Holies. And I do want to note here that there are stairs ascending because many people believe that there were stairs leading up into the most holy place. Or there would have been a small ascent up to the most holy place, which kind of makes sense again with the Sinai type imagery. And here he's pointing out that we may no longer think of biblical cherubim and seraphim as plump winged infants. They were considered in Solomon's day as hybrid creatures, part lion, part bird, part man. An ivory carving found at Megiddo shows a man of some importance seated between the cherubim, presumably one carved on each side that support his throne. And I do want to note something about this when we get to some of the other depictions of cherubim. But note here the concept of the cherubim serving as some kind of support for a throne. And here you have a depiction of the molten sea, or the bronze sea. Three for each cardinal point. Again, very much a tribes of Israel kind of symbol. Sea in the middle. But we had an entire video on that symbolism, so we're not going to go into it. And now we're going to switch over to Randall Price's book on the temple. And this is a converted EPUB, so the formatting is a little wonky, but there's good information to look at. And the section we're going to begin with is this harmonization of 1 Kings 7, 15, and 16 with 2 Chronicles 3, 15, specifically dealing with the pillars. It'll actually be easier to follow if I do this in reverse order, if I start lower and move up. Because in 2 Chronicles 3, 15, it refers to the pillars being 35 cubits long. And we discussed that in the chapter 3 video. And many commentators take this as just an exaggeration. And we kind of talked a little bit about how to think of that. But there's another way to think about this. And this is what Randall Price is arguing is a harmonization. And so what he's arguing here is that the 35 cubits comes from the construction phase when the two, presumably 17.5 cubit length pillars, were laying down next to each other end to end. Because 17.5, obviously two times, is 35 total. So he thinks that's where the 35 comes from. and there's kind of good reason to think this way. Now, here's how all of this math would work out. Because in Kings, we have this 18 cubit tall pillar. Now, because of the 35 total cubits, he thinks that in Chronicles, it's 17, 5. But how would you reconcile the difference between those two? Well, he thinks it's the capital. So you have this five cubit tall part here, as well as a hollow portion here that's half a cubit. And that would then make each of these 18 cubits tall total. So it would slide into here. And then this entire portico height is 20 cubits, but you have the one cubit base as well as this. So you have one and one plus 18, you have the 20 total. So let's go back up to his harmonization. He says, the two bronze pillars were 18 cubits high and top with decorative capitals. The decorative five cubit capital in the shape of lilies is shown fitting down over the 17.5 cubit pillar described in 2 Chronicles 3.15. The hollow pillar with a 9-inch weight-bearing surface at the top creates a total pillar capital unit of 18 cubits, as recorded in 1 Kings 7.15. So it is possible to harmonize the two accounts if you do what he does here, especially taking into account the uh, capitals. But continuing on with his book, here he has the brazen altar, the bronze altar outside, and his is more a long stretch of stairs as opposed to the one we looked at earlier which had that like ziggurat spiraling staircase here's the bronze c again we looked at a lot of this symbolism so i'm not gonna park anywhere we'll just keep moving but i want to hit this section here on the holy of holies or the most holy place he writes the innermost room was separated from the holy place by a double veil of fabric and by a wall whose only door was kept closed except on rare occasions Access to this room called the Holy of Holies was forbidden to all except the high priest, and to him only once a year on the Day of Atonement. This room was constructed as a perfect cube, about 30 feet square, and was gilded throughout with more than a ton of gold. And we've noted before that the only other perfect cube you have in the Bible is the new heavenly Jerusalem, which comes down from God from heaven to earth. I think symbolically what it's getting at is the entire 
creation, the entire world, everything is now the most holy place. Everything is now the Garden of Eden. There are no more domain differentiations. But continuing on, he says, in the middle of this windowless room stood a raised platform, the covered top of Mount Moriah that protruded within the Holy of Holies. Jewish tradition called it the foundation stone and believed it to be the center of the world and the point from which God created Adam. On this platform sat the most important of the holy furnishings, the Ark of the Covenant. And here he has depictions of this veil. And this is kind of what I wanted to talk about. Because you have these two cherubim facing each other and their wings touching. But notice how their wings form what could be a seat. You could sit there or it could support something flat that could then support a throne or whatever. Because sometimes you'll have these depictions that have the wings almost in like a W shape or something like that. And you couldn't really sit there. I mean, it wouldn't really be possible. So I think that whenever you see the depictions of the cherubim that are meant to support some kind of throne, They need to have their wings touching in this kind of flat way to provide some kind of surface. But he writes of the veil, that the veil of the temple is mentioned only in 2 Chronicles 3.14. He made the curtain of blue, purple, and crimson yarn and fine linen, with cherubim worked into it. And we noted in that lampstand video that you have these veils and curtains and things like that within the temple that have these sky colors. And then you had like the lampstand, for instance, that have this heavenly lights symbolism. So you have the sky, the heavenly lights, symbolized by the colors, by the objects. And here again, you have these sky colors, and then you have cherubim worked into it. Again, these heavenly quality symbols to them. He says, this design followed that of the tabernacle before it, and was also followed in the second temple that came after it. 1 Kings 8.8 says that the poles of the Ark of the Covenant were so long that they could be seen from the holy place. This means the poles protruded into the holy place, and only a veil would have allowed this. And again, note here his depiction of the Ark of the Covenant, the lid. In fact, when the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned, perhaps not always, but it mentions the Ark and the lid separately, as if they're two different objects. Of course, they go together, but it seems to treat the lid as if it's a separate thing entirely from the rest of the Ark. But this lid is is sometimes translated mercy seat. We've talked about this actually before on this channel. But again, this provides some kind of throne or footrest, you know, the footstool idea. But again, you have this flat surface being created by the two facing each other, wings touching, providing some kind of surface for a throne of some sort. And returning to Lightheart, page 109, he says, Mary Douglas notes the house that Jack built quality of the Levitical descriptions of sacrifice. By the way, this is a reference to Mary Douglas's book, Leviticus as Literature, which we, we've hit on before on this channel. And the house that Jack built is a nursery rhyme. And so it, it like builds on itself. So you have a rat at the beginning, and then you have a cat chasing the rat. And then you have a dog chasing the cat who chased the rat. And it kind of builds out from there. That's not how the rhyme goes. But that's basically what it's doing is it's building out the story into related characters and that kind of thing. So here, Leviticus, you have priests put animal parts on the wood that is on the fire, that is on the altar. Douglas takes this as a sign that Leviticus describes sacrifice as a construction within the altar. A small tabernacle is reproduced, the animals representing priests, the wood of the tabernacle itself formed around Yahweh's fiery presence. The chronicler borrows the same stylistic flourish to describe Hiram Abba's construction of the two bronze pillars set at the doorway of Solomon's temple. The order moves vertically and moves from structural features to ornamental features. Pillars, then capitals on the heads of the pillars, then chains networks to adorn the heads of the pillars, then pomegranates for the network's chains. The analogy with Leviticus hints that the pillars are replicating the structure of the temple as a whole. We might force or nudge the analogy with Leviticus to see the pillars as an architectural representation of sacrifice. The pillars are bronze, like the altar, and set on the ground. They extend upward, like sacrificial smoke, to an adorned capital that is linked to the most holy place. What is referring to here is the fact that it mentions the construction of these in the most holy place, which is kind of odd. We noted this in, I think, in the chapter 3 video, 
that perhaps the most holy place served as a foundry, at least in the beginning. And so part of the construction of the pillars was done in the most holy place. But continuing with Lightheart, he says, the last thing Hiram adds is pomegranates, a fruit most prominent in the Song of Songs. At the top of the pillars, one finds the fruit of love, ascending in sacrificial smoke. The worshiper enters the inner chamber of the husband of Israel to enjoy a love feast in his throne room. Pomegranates are among the fruits of the land, Deuteronomy 8-8, and here a sign of the land brought to fulfillment. The connection of the pillars with sacrifice would be an interesting concept. It could fit quite well with some of the other symbols that we've looked at. When we looked at the Bronze Sea, we argued that the object was a symbol of Yahweh as creator, the one who established order out of chaos. We then noted that the 12 bulls holding up the sea have an obvious connection to the 12 tribes, and specifically the Levites acting as the laver. This implied that the people of God were supposed to be the means of maintaining that order that God established. Similarly, God established creation on pillars. Then the task of acting as pillars fell to the people of God again. Remember, one of the pillars shared a name with David's ancestor, Boaz. So there we have a connection to the monarchy. And if what Lightheart is arguing stands, then we have God's creation being supported by the institution of sacrifice and liturgy as well. So ideally, the twin pillars are that of Yahweh's kings and priests. Of course, this falls almost straight away, but eventually will come the son of God and the son of David, one person who will be both king and priest, the chief cornerstone, and he will not fail. And in doing so, he'll make us pillars in the temple of his God, right? Revelation 3.12. So I think he may be onto something with this. But moving on with light art, he's going to track through chapters three and four and detect a creation week motif. In Exodus 25 through 31, it describes the plan, the tabernet for the tabernacle. And it's organized as seven speeches by Yahweh that follow the seven days of creation. Chronicle seems to be doing something similar. And so that's what Lightheart is going to be arguing. Now he writes in his commentary, in general, the account moves from a description of the dimensions, materials, and adornments of the three zones of the temple, porch, palace, most holy place, to a description of the items of furniture that are placed in each room, first empty rooms, then stuff to fill them. This mirrors the movement of Genesis 1 from forming to filling. And this isn't a Genesis 1 video, but quickly we'll kind of at least look at the idea. So in Genesis 1, you have the first three days are separating days, or as he put it, forming days. And then the next set of three days, days four through six, are filling days. They fill the space that was separated and they mirror each other. So day one is the separation of light and darkness. Day four corresponds to that where you have the lights, the heavenly lights, again, the menorah that we looked at in the last video, are going to govern. They're going to control, rule over the light and darkness. They're going to govern day and night. So God fills the sky with these objects. Day two, God separates the waters, the waters above, the waters below, which corresponds to day five, the birds in the air, the fish in the sea. In day three, two things happen. The dry land emerges and vegetation appears, which by the way, Notice how these things are matching. Obviously, that's what we're looking at. But people are always bothered by this. How is there vegetation before the sun in day four? Well, if you're looking at it through this lens of the way that they're interweaving with each other, that's the point. The point isn't to teach the science of it. The point is the, the way that these things are first formed and then they're filled. But this corresponds to day six, which also has two steps. You have the land animals emerge from the earth and then the creation of humans. And this might partially explain the frequent connection of plants and trees with humans that's used elsewhere in scripture. But returning back to Lightheart, he says, when the chronicler gets to his filling section, he follows the creation account in specific detail and in order. So one, within the most holy place corresponding to heaven, I would say the heaven of heavens, Solomon places two cherubim, heavenly beings, day one when God created heaven and earth. So this would be day two. The veil separates the most holy place from the rest of the temple. This corresponds to the firmament of day two. But three would be the bronze altar and sea, or the earth and sea, corresponding to day three. Four, ten lampstands are like the lights placed in the firmament on day four. 
And that one's like a direct hit. I mean, that, that's exactly what we looked at in the lampstand video. And in five, perhaps the 10 tables and 100 bowls correspond to the creation of teeming or swarming things on day five. As is often the case, the correspondences of day five are the most elusive. Even so, there does seem to be a connection, at least in some sense, because you do have by far the most things made here with the 100 bowls, which would seem to correspond with, again, this, the teeming things, the swarming things of day five. And then six, Solomon made the court of the priests and the great court for the new Adamic priests and people, day six. And then seven, Huram finished the work for Solomon, employing a verb first used in Genesis 2.1. So again, day seven. All of this would just reaffirm what we've been seeing over and over. Of the creation of the temple, mirroring that of the tabernacle that came before it, again, as well as the original creation. There are just so many touch points that even something like this that is rather speculative does seem to hit a number of places really well. So maybe there is something to this idea. And I have one last point of curiosity. Second Chronicles 4.20, among other places, refers to the inner sanctuary. The underlying terminology, the beer, is a bit odd because it looks rather like and could be related to the term the bar, the word for word, or sometimes translated as commandment. The Greek LXX simply transliterated the term, but the Latin Vulgate used the term oraculum. And you can hear the word oracle in that. So there's maybe this concept of the most holy place being associated with the place the words of God are issued from, further tying it to Sinai. Again, remember our tripartite structures, the summit of Mount Sinai. Remember, the Ten Commandments are literally the ten words in Hebrew. These words Moses received at the summit of the mount. And also the tablets were put in the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place. Of course, the Greek text often translated the bar, word, into Greek as logos. Again, John 1, in the beginning was the logos. The logos was with God. The logos was God. The logos is Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. But that is our quick tour through the temple. And we move on to the temple dedication.